So this is one of my favorite interviews, an interview with Hossein Rahman, who is the CEO and founder of Jawbone. You probably know them best for the Bluetooth headsets, but they also make things like this awesome up. This is the newly revamped one. He talks about some of the challenges in manufacturing and how he can make this thing not break when you flex it. Also talks about a time when he sat down with Steve Jobs and he completely ripped apart his product. It's a great interview. Hope you enjoy it. All right, let's start at the beginning. Yeah, Where'd man. Where'd you uh, grow up? I grew up uh, just outside of LA, Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were from the Indian subcontinent, so I had a, kind of a wacky upbringing in that I was in LA, you know, sort of half my life, and then traveling back to, 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 to Asia um, a lot, and so I got to see a lot of the world when I was really young, which is, you know, at the time felt very helter-skelter because I didn't always feel like I was part of one culture completely. like. When I was over there, I was an American. When I was here, I was from somewhere else. Right. And but the thing that was really it was really valuable to me now, uh, in my life and the, and the way it is now is that I, I feel comfortable everywhere. I feel like you know I was young, going through Asia, traveling there by myself, me and my parents doing all these things, and and um, it just gave me an appreciation for the world and all the different places that you can find inspiration. So did you were you always into computers back then, or how did you get involved was, in technology? Yeah, no, so I was into I was into making things. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, when I was young, I wanted to be a sculptor. Um, and I was into objects and materials and how beautiful you could make these things. I really liked what... Did you do like clay pots and stuff like that with the spinning <laughs> wheel? <laughs> no, I always wanted like, to learn how to do that. <laughs> like the, the sort of... Uh, the that? ghost the movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I was more into like sort of, you know, sculptural elements. Like I was really into like car design. Um, and what, you know, sort of how could you make aerodynamic shapes? Mm -hmm. What would the future look like? I we're really the same age, so I'm trying to think, like, was that like Lamborghinis you were into totally, back like there? Totally, like Countach and like all that stuff. Yeah. And then like what was next, right? And so interestingly enough, I was really into like technology from that perspective, which is how would we experience it in like our physical world? Like as a really young kid, I was super into the Jetsons. And I always felt like where, and I always still think about this now from a technology perspective, it was like where's all the stuff that was in the Jetsons? Like mm -hmm. I feel like we were promised that totally. as kids. And we never, some of it's there, but some of it's not, we're like Star Trek. So I was into like sci-fi right. and communications and, and cars and products, but I like stuff, like mm -hmm. I like things. I wanted to always make stuff. And so that's why I was, I was really sort of fascinated by sculpture because I would, I would sort of craft these like kind of clay plaster models of, of future, look, future looking cars. I wanted to go to art school. Um, my dad was, was not really that supportive of it. Um, so I ended up going to uh, Stanford and did sort of mechanical engineering and design awesome. before there was a D school because that was where my, my focus was and, and my interest. And it turned out to be a great thing because we were at Stanford in the mid 90s and it was this like incredible explosion of entrepreneurial ideas the internet, and being in the internet yeah. coming. And What'd you build? What were some of the projects you did when you were there? If you were oh man, like uh, one of my first shop classes I made um, a kind of a futuristic looking bookshelf um, out of milled ABS and it was in these sort of trapezoidal shapes and then I had like a metal plane that was going through it and I was really into how do you fix the shelf and the metal, it was like a magazine rack bookshelf thing. And it was like how do you fix that shelf and make it stable without showing any lines of where it would connect into the support structure, mm -hmm. right? So were you then, learning CAD at this time as well? Yeah, we were doing like, you know, some of the Pro-E and some of this kind of stuff and, mm -hmm. and building. The cool thing about Stanford those days is that you were pretty cross-functional. So I took like a bunch of electrical engineering classes so I understood like electronics and sort of how computers worked at a, at a real fundamental level. And then obviously you had to do software as well. So it was like an amazing time because Everyone was creating. There was this incredible excitement about what the possibilities were. I remember, I think it was like my sophomore year, the first time like I saw the web, right? And back in those days, it was like Yahoo and ESPN. Right. Like ESPN was so early. That's crazy. To the web. I wonder who it was over there. That As somebody was like on, on it. Like yeah, ESPN don't. was one of like the biggest destinations in like 1994. Had like 50 unique visitors a day. Kind of <laughs> right, 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 right. And I remember learning to code in HTML and being like, wow, this is amazing. And having like your profiles show up. and. They made you, as an engineering student, everyone had like their own web page. And even in those days, like email, like when I got to Stanford, dude, like walked in the computer lab and there was this like black monolith in the corner. And it was all a bunch of like Apple, you know, Macintoshes and stuff, Mac SC, I don't even remember what versions of Mac it was. And then there was this like thing, each computer lab had a black box. And it was just like really interestingly designed object. 
and it was Next. Oh, interesting. Right, and so there was like a Next in every computer lab. Huh. Apple was always really supportive of that, of that journey. And then I remember sort of part way through, we went from learning how to do everything on Macs, right? From like I remember setting up an email address for the first time, doing all that stuff, and then we went from Macs, and then we switched over to PCs. Right. right, and so much of that CAD software and all that kind of thing was on PC, so it was mm -hmm. like a completely different world. Um, and what was interesting is like, this was also right around the time, so this is now kind of, I started at Stanford in 93, mm -hmm. and so by the like mid 90s, I remember the first time we saw Palm Pilot. Mm -hmm. And my co-founder I, I wanted one so oh, bad. Oh, dude, it was, it was crazy. It was such an amazing object, yeah. right, of desire, and that it sort of, that, that's why I think I got really into making things because I always had that sort of passion around materials and how you feel stuff and that physical experience with it. And when you combine that with what you can do with technology. So my co-founder Alex actually was the first dude I ever met at, at Stanford who had a Palm Pilot. And mm. he was pretty badass because mm. no one on campus had one at that time. This, this, is, so like, cool. this is like 95, 96, right? And yeah. it was like, I remember sitting in like a class and the screen lighting up with the green backlight. Mm -hmm. And how, how how sick it was, and being able to like upload your contacts and graffiti yeah. And, yeah. and all that stuff. And so that was actually a big part of our inspiration behind Jawbone because we we were sort of thinking about user interface at that time, and we said, this is great in this kind of mobile device environment to be able to you know now take something that you used to have to type into, reduce the interface to something that's very natural, which is writing. Mm -hmm. But guess what? When you're walking down the street or you're trying to be mobile with that kind of a device that's not a great interface. So our, our view, our vision was, could we try to create sort of essentially like Siri, and this is kind of like 96, 97, like a voice controlled interface mm -hmm. for mobile devices, mm -hmm. right? Which would be on top of the next generation of graphical input. How would you do input. that though? Because like 96, 97, there was no Bluetooth at that point, right? Well, we, we weren't even thinking about Bluetooth. We were just thinking on the device, could you create a, a layer on top of the OS? What would you, would it be an app for a Palm Pilot? But would there were no be? apps then. Right, so, right. What, what, so we were, were trying create? to figure out how to like layer on top of the hardware. It was like pretty complex. Yeah, how right? would you even do that? Would you partner with Palm Pilot? Well, we were, we were trying to architect it, but we started from like the user problem, mm -hmm. which is like, how would you integrate speech recognition? So like, what, we, what my partner Alex was doing was a lot of like, how would the menu structure work and how would you come on top of this? And then we looked at, well, does this mean that we have to like build our own device on top of this? Like, how does this all work? And then we started to realize, actually before we even got to like, how would we put it on top? You'd have to work really closely with the manufacturers, right? But we realized um, that everything we wanted to do with speech recognition was like virtually impossible. The computing power wasn't there? The, the, the computing, the recognition accuracy wasn't there, and, and basically speech recognition is like one big search problem, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens when you get on the street and there's other people talking or there's music playing or whatever it is, and everyone's experience is call into like United Airlines, trying to find your flight information with an automated assistant, it doesn't work all the time, right. right? And a lot of that is because of this variability in the background environment. So we said, well, if we could figure out how to clean up that inbound signal, going into the speech recognition system, we could have a really revolutionary effect on the accuracy of that, right? And this is right around the time we had sort of formed the company, Alex and I were at dental school. Um, this is like sort of 99, 98. We started to like think mm -hmm. about how would we implement this type of a speech recognition layer on top of these OS is a big yeah. business development challenge, by the way. Did you go into, did you have a little side jobs at that point in time to kind of pay the bills? Or how were you able to go straight from like graduating school to re well, this research project? Well, we basically were we we were fortunate in that like we had you know we had you know made a little money through like internships and stuff like that and like look we were just we were both out my co-founder and I were like our were brothers were living or something or? We, well we're, our both of our older brothers were like living my older brother got to Stanford and, and his was in the business school my co-founder Alex so we were both actually like squatting in our older brother's apartments okay and actually the first like co incorporated address of Jawbone was my older brother's apartment at 555 Stanford Ave, which I think is now like a Starbucks or something. It was on Stanford Avenue, like right across from the graduate graduate student housing. So that's how we were able to kind of scrape by is we had gotcha. like a little bit of cash, but didn't have to like pay for housing. And we were figuring this out and this is sort of like 99 now. And so we, you're still in your first job out of school. This is the only job I've ever had. That's amazing. <laughs> I've had one job, dude. Um, which I feel lucky about, you know, and it's been sort of a, a, an up and down journey um, through that. And there were times where it looked like I might need to have another job, but um, fortunately, um, it's sort of been up and to the right uh, as of late. But 
um, we, uh, it, it was unbelievable because it, we, we basically found this amazing, our chief scientist, um, uh, Greg, who was the inventor of, of Noise Assassin. Um, what year was this? This is like circa 99. And okay. he had developed, he was doing his PhD thesis at um, Lawrence Livermore mm -hmm. National Labs. And at the, at the lab, which by the way is out in the East Bay, and it's like the How largest. How did you find him? One of our old EE professors had been approached by these guys. They were doing really crazy stuff with sensors to understand like human speech. And we thought, wow, this, they, they were using, this is the crazy part. They were using these micropower radars to detect when your vocal folds were vibrating. Wow. Which turns out to be a perfect indicator of when you're talking, right? And, and so basically, we looked at that and we said, wow, if you could know when someone's talking, you can therefore get rid of all the noise because you can separate those two things if you're looking at an acoustic signal, mm -hmm. right? And then when you know it's pure speech, that'll make the recognition thing work a lot hmm. better. So that was the so interesting you, thing. you kind of record the background noise so you know what that is. You're and recording you can all that the acoustic, that's right, you're recording the, all the acoustic signal. Mm -hmm. And then when you get this detection of when speech is going, you subtract out the model that you made of all that noise. Hmm. This was like the core innovation. Um, and so the way, we, the, the way the whole thing started is like, look, we said, what, there's this problem of interface. We want to be doing speech-driven stuff, which, by the way, I still believe in. And, and it was when Siri came out, we were just like, wow, this is what we had essentially wanted to build. But it needed to be so deeply integrated into the OS. So I don't know what we were thinking in terms of how we would have actually pulled that off mm -hmm. um, execution-wise. I guess we would have like pitched it to Palm or Nokia or one of these guys like buy us or whatever. But we ended up just stumbling on this like core technology. And when we built that, the noise assassin technology it turned out to be the biggest breakthrough in mobile audio in like 30 years. Tell, tell me, I, I for sure read all the articles and, and I had the first job when it came out, but jump back to the point when you first started building that. How do you even start to come up with a prototype? Yeah. <laughs> So you've got this thesis, and you're like, okay, I think this is what's going to work. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, well, so, how would you? So the way the way you do it, I mean, you do it on like breadboards and like circuits, and you put these things together. And we had like duct tape sensors, and I mean, it it was real science projecty stuff. And you'd tape them to your face. And so you were like taping stuff to your face. Totally. That's when you had that little nub. That was like the first thing. It was you an used. accelerometer. Oh, interesting. Right. So Which that now was an accelerometer. These are the same the same you know earlier versions of accelerometers that are in up. Yeah. Which is the interesting thread that goes all the way through. So we were looking at sensors and what they could do really early, right? And you started with like huge. Yeah, I mean it was big. Large. We took like off-the-shelf headsets and like cut them up, and I mean it's real like science projecty stuff. I'm sure it's around here somewhere, but um, it was cool. And, and we used to travel with these things. And sort of post 9/11, it was crazy because we had all these like wires and boxes with tape and, 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 and these Pelican briefcases. It was it was crazy, you know. Um, but yeah, so that was like the dawn of noise suppression, noise, what we call noise assassins, how we built it, turned out to be this huge breakthrough. You'd we, formed the company at that point. Yeah, we started the company in 99. And did you, did you get funding? Did you take funding? We'd taken a little bit of angel funding in sort of late 99, early 2000. So you just met um, with some investors and kind of showed them yeah, the Yeah, but listen, it was an awesome, well, we had a bunch of slides of what we were going to do. This was even before the prototype was going. We had some noise samples um, of, of what we could do. And I mean, it was awesome. Like the optimism, I don't know if you remember the optimism in like 99 yeah. for ideas yeah, was totally. incredible. Like it was unbridled. You got really lucky. You barely missed 2000. We hit the window, would, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then it was like that optimism turned to darkness. Right, for years. <laughs> for yeah. years, right? Um, and it, it's funny, I tell a lot of entrepreneurs now, like it was not like a founder friendly valley at all. Right. Right, it was like come up with an idea as a founder, make it, we'll take it, thank you very much, hire a team you guys can like hang out in the back somewhere, right? Um, and I think it was really, um, you know, frankly, Steve Jobs and a few people like that, and even Zuck, um, who sort of changed the course of like how the investment community viewed founders running companies and saw that you could build these great companies if you sort of could help these guys become great managers and mm -hmm. great leaders of, of businesses, right? Yep. Um, and I think that's been a wonderful transformation in the industry because I can tell you it was not like that mm -hmm. in 99, right? So, um, but anyways, we were fortunate. We, we convinced some people um, to, to give us a little bit of capital. It was about like a million bucks. And we started to take those prototypes and really refine them. And the original business model was to license our technology. So we thought... Was it going to be software that you would license out there? It would there? be algorithms that okay. were enabled by sensors. Right. So what you had to do was basically figure out how to get some contact on the skin to do this, this accelerometrics. Then you had to figure out how to add another microphone, 
right? So when we were going, what we did sort of starting in like early 2000s, we started going and seeing all the handset guys. Because mm -hmm. we thought, wow, this is gonna be like the Dolby of the mobile space. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go license this thing everywhere. It's even bigger than speech recognition. It like allows you to communicate in the noisiest environments. We had these amazing demos with like weed whackers and, and all kinds of stuff. Later when we started working with DARPA, we did them and we tested in tanks and helicopters and all kinds of like crazy places. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and so basically what we, what we ended up doing was um, taking this, this sort of raw technology and figure, trying to figure out like a reference design that a phone guy could go take and we would license them mm -hmm. the whole thing. But it was a hard sell because they were like, there were so many things trying to get into phone and this was like the explosion of the mobile phone industry, mm -hmm. right? This is when like Nokia really started to take off. All these yeah. devices were really Prices were finally out. coming down to the point where everyone could It was getting mass, them. right? Yeah. You're starting to see people who were f dumping mm -hmm. landlines. This is kind of like circa 2000. Um, the apps that were killer in mobile, I remember in those days the killer mobile apps were like ringtones. Yeah. Right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> And that was big business. It was a big business for a while. Um, there were no sort of application platforms, and then email was a killer app, right? Um, which is amazing. And so this is even before smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking like just you know really basic, simple devices. And and um, even in those days, there were like sort of simple feature phones, and people were that we we went to like you know see you know Espoo Finland to see Nokia. We were in Lund to to see Ericsson and. Spent a bunch of time in Schaumburg, Illinois. You know, coldest winter I ever spent. Was out there trying to convince Motorola to like put our technology in. Did devices. anybody buy it at all? They were really interested in the performance, but they saw this like they had to put a new mic in, they had to put another sensor, they had to then pay us a licensing fee. So they were like, look, you know, if we do this, it's going to be a very small licensing fee. And then one of the things that happened to us is we've been talking to other people like in the headset space, in Punchonics and Jabra, and we thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. Where our technology is really disruptive in this space. Could mm -hmm. we um, could we do something where we actually build our own product? Because we we thought well, that's when we started to conceive of it, saying, you know, maybe we don't want to be on licensing business. Maybe we want to like actually go back to our roots of making things mm -hmm. and actually build like build the whole thing. Um, and that was hard. That was insane. Trying to raise money to do that in sort of 2003 was was really challenging. We were fortunate enough to do it, um, and we made the first Jawbone headset. In 2004, I don't know if you remember it. It was like silver and wire. That's when we teamed up with Eve, Bahar, because the yeah. whole idea was like functional jewelry. This is this is the cool thing that that I really want to spend a, a second on that I'm fascinated by. Yeah. How do you say I want to build a piece of hardware, and then go from that idea to prototypes to manufacturing right. to in the box on the shelves at Best Buy? Like, right. how does that process happen? Yeah, so and it's easier now than it was. I mean, what we ended up doing was hiring people. We went to Asia, this is when I started spending a lot of time in Asia, sort of circa Where? Where 2003 in China, Taiwan, How do you China. know, I mean, like, let's we, say I wanted to go build a device t tomorrow, like, who do you call? Like, you don't just, like, fly to China. Right, well, the interesting thing is, like, now those companies out there, the big manufacturers, are used to seeing interesting new ideas from startups. In 2002, three, they were not interested in a bunch of you know kids with Did big ideas. Did they have English-speaking people there that you some, could go? Some, some. We would travel with translators and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like it was like this sort of crazy challenge. What was it like? And you go out there and you sit down at a table and you have a translator and you're like, "Here's my idea." Like, yeah. One, it could be copied. It could be stolen. It could like they could take your your spec. Well, see, and this run is the thing it, that we like, knew is that our technology was so complicated and there was so much IP, intellectual property around it, that it was gonna be hard for them to figure this out on okay. their own, right? So at least we had that sort of comfort level, right? That if anyone was gonna build it, it was difficult. But here's the thing that we learned was that you need so many things to line up on the hardware side to get it right. You need the battery technology to come along with you and sort of get to the right place. You need the chipsets that the computer hardware, right, to enable your application. Did you find someone that had done this before? Was that the key to Yeah, we had we had a few it? people around us who had done that before. Eve had built a lot of products, right? So we we had some of that. We had a number of people who came on board who had worked at Palm, who had worked at Apple. So um, a big part of your job then was just recruiting people. Yeah, and was trying to convince them that we should do this. Mm -hmm. And and um, so you would go and sit down with a potential candidate that had a bunch of experience in manufacturing and hardware design, things like that. Show them your idea, right? And say, I want you to join us because I need your help in launching. Yeah, this and thing. we had hired some senior people to help us too. Gotcha. So they recruited some of their friends and people they worked on. 
and all that kind so of stuff. So that's kind of your strategy is like get an anchor in that can then bring in people they've worked with in the past. That was, the, yeah, that was the strategy. Um, I think that the interesting thing that we learned through that process, so our first job on headset was like, it didn't, it didn't do that well. It got a lot of critical acclaim, but the product experience wasn't totally resolved. Like what was it, wrong with it? It had these proprietary connectors, so there was only a limited universe of phones. Like it only supported some Nokia phones, some Motorola phones. It had like a little dongle clip that you clipped on your shirt and it was wired. It was, it was just sort of this kludgy implementation. And that's what you realize when you do hardware is we actually got it working. One of the other things that happened to us along the way in 01 when things really went south in the technology industry where there was just no money available, DARPA came to us and they said, you know what, we see a lot of promise in this technology that you have for noise cancellation. We'd like to use it as part of our next generation communication strategy um, for military applications. Hmm. Um, and it was a great way for us to work with them. They gave us a bunch of research contracts. It was a great way for us to take really kind of theoretical science, raw science, and, and, and productize it and get it to a form where we could refine it and utilize it. So it was kind of like people's taxpayer dollars hard at work. Mm -hmm. um, and then you um, share technology back to them. That they have know. rights to use it for, you know, sort of whatever. Whatever application, whatever projects. militaristic yeah. endeavors that they want right. to do with it, um, of which we're not privy to anymore. But, um, so they, they have the ability to do that. And, but it was a great way for us to sort of take this, this technology, refine it, build new prototypes. You know, we, 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 because we had had sort of an engineering background on hardware, we knew what it meant to tool up parts. We knew what the electronics needed to look like. There's a lot of, there at the time, there were like these little you know, consulting shops around the valley where you could go to them. They'd make you a circuit board. They'd help you design the circuit board. They'd help you think about the mechanicals for manufacturing. So there are these pockets of people um, that, that work for a lot of big companies. I mean, HP and Palm and Dell and all these guys use a lot of these designers hmm. in that ecosystem. It's so when we Interesting. Team to, when we and team that still exists today. It absolutely still exists today. I mean, you, you so get like these little, firms. Like, um, but even firms like IDEO provide some of these services, right? Mm -hmm. But like when we started working with Eve, he knew a guy that was like a great mechanical engineer that could help us figure out how to do the surface modeling of all of the, the exterior parts and what they needed to sort of look like in CAD to be injection molded and all that kind of stuff. and and. So it's, it's a lot of work and it's complex. And I think that what we realized in that first go around with the product is you need all of those things to come together. Like you can't, this is the interesting thing about doing hardware is you can't give, you can't let up on one piece because you don't have a, the ability to iterate in market. You can't put it out there. Um, and this is what's been fascinating to us is the companies evolved. We have so much sort of software now, not only powering our devices, but applications that people interact with, particularly on something like up. And the thing that's, that's crazy is like, it's such a different mindset where you can put something out, you can see what users say, you can test a reaction, you can iterate, you can mm -hmm. sort of evolve. Like when we want to iterate something, it's like 12 weeks to create a new machine tool to injection mold apart, right? right. If we right. just want to change the radius on a surface by half a millimeter. It's such a different world. It's yeah. such a different world. So what it requires you to do is be a lot more disciplined about what problem are you trying to solve for the user, mm -hmm. right? And make sure that you're ruthless about every decision that you make underneath that umbrella and, and fundamentally, you have to sort of think about, is somebody gonna pay me for what I'm doing here more than what it takes for me to actually do it? So it's just, right. I've gotta be able to sell it to somebody and they see enough value in it for more than what it costs me to make right. it. And if you can't do that, you're screwed. Like you just, you can't make it, right? So what do you think about, you know, one, th one of the things, and I'm pull kind of pulling from various conversations we've had over the last few weeks yeah. and, and, and hanging out, but like, what do you think about, you're telling me that you have had, you had a team, or you still have, obviously, a very large team of people that are working on a single device. Yeah. That are working in, on the manufacturing side, on the development side, on the design side, on the, you know, changing one little mold. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. How can a well, team... Well, the, the team stack up is crazy. I mean, you're talking about, for like a headset or an audio product, you have a digital signal processing team that are building the audio algorithms and the mm -hmm. things that noise cancel or make the sound three-dimensional. What's the entire, right? what are you talking, 50 people, 75 people to build something like that? Um, probably on that order, right? Then you have a bunch of mechanical engineers, you have people that are laying out the circuit boards that are interfacing with manufacturing engineers. So, there are people who are sourcing parts, right? There are people who are looking for new materials. Like on Jambox, we bend metal in ways that no one's ever done before. So, how so we can, have to have people who find the vendor that can do that. What I'm, what I'm shocked at is that 
I see Kickstarter projects launching, and you must just be laughing your ass off when you see some <laughs> of these Kickstarter projects, with like a team of like two guys being like, we're gonna make the next, and it's like some crazy like hoverboard or some, something like that is right. insane. Right, right. Like, are, is that just craziness? Like, is that, is, cause a lot of these, I mean, I've, I've probably invested in four or five projects. Right. I would say probably, I think all of them have been delayed right. by months and months. <laughs> right. Is that just gonna be the norm and will these projects ever get off the ground? Like, does it really require a team of 50 people to launch something like this? Or is there something that's happening, some efficiency on the back end like over in China that we're not seeing that's gonna make it possible for smaller teams to actually get out quality, yeah, pro yeah. So quality products? I think it depends on the product, right? Right, everything's so different. Everything's different. So I think from when we started to now, first of all, the ecosystem's changed dramatically. So you get the Chinese manufacturers who have a lot of these resources in-house. So you can go to them with a concept and say, I want to build this thing. Um, is the quality here. control really there, though? We believe that to get to the level of quality, like my view is like, look, Apple changed everything in terms of what people's expectations are right. of what they should experience in a physical product. Mm -hmm. They set the bar so high in terms of that integration between the hardware, the software, how beautifully machined all these things are. That's the expectation that we have That's for great hardware. That's guys though too. I mean, well, I would thank say there's you. only no. other, you're probably the only other company that I know that cares that much about design. Yeah, well thank you, no, and, and it's paid off for us, right? And, and, and that's just part of your DNA. But so to do that level of work and that level of craftsmanship, you've got to get your own people on the ground there mm -hmm. who know culturally how you think about stuff and can say no. Because everything when you're not on top of it, I don't care if this is in like inter consumer internet software or mechanical engineering, everything drifts to the lowest common denominator unless somebody's there to hold the line mm -hmm. and hold the standard, mm -hmm. right? And when you have large teams that are distributed all over the planet, you have an easier path to that lowest common denominator. And so I think that if you just throw things over the fence to Asia, that happens. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, a lot of these companies are getting better and better because they've been inspired by what Apple's done. And they mm -hmm. realize that you've got to raise your bar to that. It's not just about the cheapest parts or the, the least, you know, um, the lowest cost manufacturing that you want quality and that people demand that. And if you do it well, there's a market of bazillions of people who buy that stuff. But going back to your Kickstarter question for a second, I think what's awesome about Kickstarter is that you now, like if I think about the product development process of hardware, you start with a concept, which is really about what is the problem that we're solving, mm -hmm. right? And are we really addressing a user need? Then you start to see like, all right, what's the landscape around that? Are there solutions that are doing it? Do we have to invent technology? Do we have to buy technology? Do we have to license it? How do we pull all those enabling core technologies together? Mm -hmm. How do we put that all? We start to concept that, really start to get tight on what the definition of the product looks like. What Kickstarter allows you to do at that stage is to go out and test. Do people actually give a shit, mm -hmm. right? Is there like a there there that, 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 that people will be into, right? Pre-production. Pre-production, like, yeah, which so is I think awesome. It, which is awesome, because it takes a lot of the guesswork out of That's it. interesting, because you, do, you never do that, right? You like, never do that. You go out and you launch something, and you're like, we're, we're looking around the corner. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Jamo's a great example. Like, I would say half the organization here thought we were crazy. We had a bunch of guys who'd worked at Sony on building speakers, and they were like, this is the dumbest idea ever. Why are we building a speaker? Like, this is a hard market, there's lots of people in it. And we were like, no, no, we're gonna turn the thing into a computer. And it's gonna be for your phone, and it's gonna be for Spotify, and it's gonna be a totally new world. And we were able to like carve out this new space, and it worked, it worked big. But it was- Was that a, you sitting there and just kind of like, how it, did you identify it? Well, it was crazy. So I got, one of, one, of, one of our guys brought me a prototype. It's a funny story, actually. He brought me this like prototype, and it was this like little black, quite ugly, actually, sort of black, plastic thing. Did he go off and work on it without they, your permission or yeah, anything? Yeah, this, this happens. You know, people That's cool. That's it's, a great We love that. We want have. that. We want the people to tinker and sort That's of come up with ideas. Many great, I mean, Gmail, tons of great products have come out of tinkering. With people tinkering. Yeah, yeah no, so we encourage that, right? Um, and, and and so, you know, one of, our, one of our key guys brings me this thing. I'm like, what is that? He's like, it's a speaker. And I also was like, really? I mean, like, That's a crowded category. There's so many people in it. And, and, and this thing is like hideous looking. What are you? What are you talking about? And he was like, "Just listen to it." I was like, "Nah, really? I, I don't. I don't want to do this." And he's like, "Just listen to it, man." And so I listened to it, and I was like, "Oh my god, 
this thing is like this big and it sounds like it's this big. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I was like, wait, now can I use that with like my phone? What if we did this? What if we made it a beautiful object? And then we just saw it, right? And then that was the journey. And that was a product from concept to ship was six months, mm -hmm. which was amazingly fast, right? And, and we got it out and it's done, you know, millions of units and it sort of changed the landscape of that industry. Everybody has one. It's crazy. Everyone has one. It's like changed it's the awesome. landscape of that industry. But, but, but so going back to that thing about, it's amazing and remarkable what Kickstarter's done because now you can validate your idea, right? In a big right. way and be like, people care. Mm -hmm. um, all of the other stuff in terms of like, how do you build it? How do you do the engineering validation? Build the prototypes, refine it, scale it, distribute it. All that stuff is hard. Mm -hmm. Right? How do you get to the right quality output? All that stuff is still complicated. Yeah, we were talking before we turned the cameras on. You were saying, I mean, it's you, you have low points in your life where you're like, you hit walls, right? I mean, even with totally. up, up off the when you got off the ground with Massive. up, right? I mean, up was after we sold 10 million units of things. That's insane. Right? <laughs> and we know how to make really small, and complex. And you ran into manufacturing we problems. We ran into crazy. I mean, this was the craziest journey from a product perspective that we've ever been on. And in, in some ways it's turned out to be the most wonderful thing that ever happened to the company because we've learned so much about how you make a computer that's wearable and waterproof and bendable. And what, what you realize about like wearable stuff like this, even the difference from going from your ears to your wrist, mm -hmm. is that a lot of stuff happens to you on your wrist that you don't even think about. Mm -hmm. Like we were testing this thing, we did like 46 weeks of user tests after we had the, the, the initial challenges. and. It was crazy because we'd see these like traumatic failure events with these products and we'd ask the people who were testing, we're like, what happened? They're like, nothing. We're like, no, no, something happened. This thing's like shattered inside. Right. And then going through the forensics of dissecting their day and understanding like how they move through the wow. day, you realize they went home and their kid grabbed their arm and yanked the thing off. And they didn't even think about it. Right, they just picked it back up and it, it doesn't look shattered. About it. it doesn't it's look shattered. Beautiful shell. But the internals yeah. were like completely kaput, right? And she's like, oh my God, how do we like life proof this stuff? Right. Right. How do we accommodate for that like normal, yeah. like you just, you picked up your kid. And they, it's like on a very know, like fast moving. It's like, just, and, yeah, and you don't think about all of these. Yeah, of yeah, you don't think about the sort of how people move through their day and, and all that stuff. So we have to like design for that. We have to test for that. We have to build for that. Um, and it was an interesting journey and a, and a real labor of, of love and intensity. And then just, you know, the, the difference between we argue here over millimeters, like fierce millimeters, like half a millimeter, because it makes a difference. The way you round that edge, the way you stuff the components, how thick the walls are that are encasing the electronics, it makes a difference about whether you'll wear it to bed, which then means I can't track your sleep if you don't wear it to bed. Interesting. Which means I get no engagement on that part of my app. And so when I look at the class curves, sleep's dropping off. Why? Because it's too big, no one wants to wear the fucking mm -hmm. thing. You, right? you told me and one time that you wanted to make it, like even if it wasn't working, you wanted to make it beautiful enough to where people consider it jewelry, right? Jewelry, and that, well that's the design bar. So when we team up with Eve, we say, look, Eve, you gotta give us something that is so cool that people would love it as an object if it had no functionality. Mm -hmm. And if we can achieve, that's kind of like a holy grail, right? And if we can get to that place, then we know that we're winning. Because ultimately, like the tech has to disappear. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that we've learned again and again and again is that people at a mass market level want the tech to just disappear. They did want you to ever just meet like, Jobs? Did you ever hang out with him? It seems like you guys have a lot in common. Uh, um, I did. Uh, first time I met him was in 2004, right before we debuted our, um, our first, you know, sort of wired headset product at the D conference, where it was like, whenever that was, it was like May, June of 2004. It was the second D. Um, we did this whole thing with Walton Carroll where we were like weed whackers and blenders and demoed it on stage. It was, it was crazy. But right before that, I met Steve for the first time and we'd gone down there and it was sort of set up by our, our big investor at the time, um, Yogan Delal from Mayfield. He was like, go down and see Steve and just show him like what you guys are working on. So we went down there and, and I have to tell you, it was like pretty tough um, because basically for 45 minutes, he like ripped through every single deepest, darkest fear wow. that we had about our product. And like, it was and so He didn't quick. even know about it? He didn't know about it. He didn't it. know about the product, and he just walked no, no, in no, cold? No, no, he walked in cold. Yogan had told him a little bit about it. We walked into this thing, and he was just like, boom. What did he say? Straight, why is that edge that way? Why didn't you use a piece of silicon that would allow you to make this small? Why do you have like a thing on your ear, then a clip? No one's gonna do that. The only place anyone would clip anything is in your mind. Like you've just, you've not thought about the consumer in this way and, and you were like, wow, yes, I was nervous about that and you're right. So that was the <laughs> thing that was crazy was that 
it was so insanely commonsensical mm -hmm. that you're like, of course, of course. It was just this level of like consumer insight and just thinking about like how people would use shit mm -hmm. that you were like, damn, how did I miss that? And so in some ways it was hard as hell because it's like we'd taken all this time, it was like the first hardware product that we designed, we are like working with Eve, we thought we were really good at like design and like we knew all this stuff and we went in front of like the God and he was just like, mm. <laughs> it was not, it was not, it, it was like, like that, that, right? It was just like, and it that, was humbling. Like, did that crush you when you went home at yeah, night? Or? It was crushing, but it was also like absurdly inspiring because the thing that we kept, I kept coming back to was like, we knew all this shit. Mm -hmm. We knew exactly what he was talking about. There was nothing there that it was like, so different than, that's what I was saying, he exposed all these deep, dark things that we'd sort of hidden from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was probably one of the most like important moments in like my life around just being true to at a product level. So do you say no a lot more after that meeting? Yeah, well we just like put our, in any, it, 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 what I realized is like we had to change the culture of our company. Where in it wasn't, it wasn't, well, cause it's up to that point was, it was all about like, okay, we've defined something and we've got to ship it because we defined it. And then sometimes you realize when you're creating new things, that doesn't work because you'll build it and you realize, oh my God, that didn't work. Like that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. it's, just, it's not just right. Just because you built it doesn't mean you have to it ship it. It doesn't mean you have to ship it, right? And I think that's, that's true with hardware or software. Now in hardware it's a little harder because you just, the cost of doing it is, 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 was harder. It's better now, but still like, so that's, you've got to get. That's a great point though. It's also really difficult. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. Like we spent, probably three or four months building one release of, of Dig where I looked at it and I was like, it doesn't feel right, but it's gonna be a blow to all of the engineers if I say, hey, let's scrap this and, and do something over. else. Yeah. Like, so how, how do you balance that, Yeah, exactly, that, right? how That's, do you balance that? This is the hardest thing. But I think if they know what the mission is, mm -hmm. and the mission is like greatness, right. and you just are so passionate about the problem you're solving, and you can all look at each other and you have that trust where it's mm -hmm. like, guys, we're not there. Mm -hmm. And it's not about egos or right. someone's opinion or whatever. It's about like, you just don't feel like you're doing the best work. The best people will go with that, yeah. I think. Yeah, that's cool. And they have to, right? I think you have to do that culturally if you want to be great and like change the game in an industry or redefine a carry, not just be a me too thing. So right? how were you changing your culture then you said? Well, when we came back and we said like, guys, we gotta like be hard on ourselves, right? And so when, like this is, this is a lesson that like has kept coming. Like, so when we did our first Bluetooth version, like the company almost died and you know, because that, that wired product was not very successful, we went down to a really small group and we focused on, on making it Bluetooth so we could get rid of the connectors and do that. And we had created a design and we were sort of, you know, there's all these different phases of hardware development. You have like concept, engineering validation, design validation, you know, pre-production, testing, and then ramp. And we were kind of in the engineering, about to go into engineering validation and maybe design validation. And I'll never forget this, we went to CES, right? And this was, we were like lean, mean team, no money. We were sort of hustling, trying to get this thing going. And even I walked around CES and there were all these other Bluetooth headsets and they were like much smaller than what we were doing. And yeah, we had a much cooler design and much cooler tech, but the thing was just like bloated. Mm -hmm. And he and I looked at each other like, dude, we can't ship this thing. Like it's just, it's not gonna work. Like we're, we're gonna do it, we've put all this energy into it, we've oh, hustled to keep that's this thing alive. That's a lot of work pressure, that you have right? to scrap, We right? had to scrap everything and it was just like massive. We came back, saw my co-founder, it was kind of the how three of us. How do investors feel about that? Well at that time our investors had kind of just said, you know, you guys do your thing. Cause they sort of thought it was, it was done. Um, but it was even just our internal, like my co-founder had been slaving on it and there's a team of people that were working on it in Asia. We'd convince his manufacturing partner to help us. but. You know, when you argue from that position of like, is this gonna work with the consumer? Right. Ultimately, that's the most, that's the most truthful thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. Because it's just so raw, it's so fundamental. Sure. Right, and you just, if you, that's, and that's what I learned like weirdly from that conversation with Job, the first one, where it was like, if you stop being true to that, and every time we've stopped being true to that, we missed it, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's, we always come back to that, which is like, what is that higher order thing I know you guys are gonna be demotivated because we tried, but know that we're signing up for this journey and mm -hmm. that there will be things we chuck. You gotta get, and so I think being, what we also you learned is- You set that expectation up front. We're getting better at it, mm -hmm. you know? Like it's still hard, because you just sometimes you forget and sometimes you think you've got the answer. Um, and that's the hardest part about creation, right? And that's what we come back to Kickstarter, like. 
that's what's cool about Kickstarter is you can kind of validate some of that stuff early on. Do you invest in Kickstarter projects? I do. You I do. do. Yeah, I've done like what twelve. Have, what of them. have you done that you really? I like? did like Twine. I haven't gotten it yet. I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Twine, dude, send me the shit. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I that was my favorite one. I did um, boosted boards at skateboard. Did you? The electric skateboard is so awesome. cool. Did I saw a it? demo of it. Not yet. I think. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, I, I love the energy of making. Yeah. I love that people are getting into making stuff again. 3D printing is amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm happy about it. I just, what I, what I want and what I hope for is that people really understand where they are in the cycle mm -hmm. and that you got to prove these things out. Go invest in getting it done right and do what it takes to do that and don't shortchange that mm -hmm. because you'll take these great ideas like a badass electric skateboard and it'll never ship and everyone's bummed. Because yeah. they would like that product to be in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's my sort of sort of view of that. And I wonder if there's a way that you can connect that type of thing to somebody who can really make those. And is there a way that we can create sort of like a, a part of the industry where in the manufacturing side where there's these high quality bars and it's almost like going to an academy of learning to make things at like an Apple-like level, right? right? Um, I don't know, maybe. That's an area of, of potential innovation. Yep. So. So I know you got to run. I want to ask you one, one last question though. Mm, mm. Um, where does where does the up go in five years? <laughs> where do the? I mean, is, I, I'm fascinated by this space, like the quantified self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems like if, it feels to me, it's like it's like um, cell phones in like the early '90s. Like you look at it and you're like. Oh, it's gonna be cool, and yes, I want to have one with me. Yeah, but it doesn't do anything but make phone calls. Like, no. what do you think these? Where, where will these devices oh, man, go? I think it's like so. When I think about this, I think about like, what have the killer apps in wearables been, right? And like, there was you know corrective eyewear, there was consuming audio, telling time. Is this a killer app in wearables? Should it be integrated in your clothes? And then how's it connecting to all the other things in your life? I believe that when you're wearing something. It's so personal and so intimate with you mm -hmm. that it's a better and a deeper relationship than you have with your phone. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in terms of it's identity? It's a style type thing. It's yeah. a style thing. And so like people buy you, different watches. Totally. And, Day, yeah. night, mm -hmm. weather differences. We don't wear the same shit here in San Francisco that we do, you know, now that we do, well, I guess in the summer we do here, but in October <laughs> we don't, right? We right. wear sort of different things. And so you have differences of what you wear based on seasons, time of day, your mood, all kinds of stuff. How do you adapt into that kind of behavior? How do you make this stuff so interwoven? How does it become you? How does it like be the storage of your personal likes and dislikes? How does it connect to everything? Mm -hmm. So I think health is an awesome part of that application, get people going, mm -hmm. because- Is health I, a big driver for it, do you think? It is, because the thing that's interesting to us, like when we got in this space is, I've never been in a category like this where every single person I talk to, like I still meet people who are like, you know what, I don't listen to music on my phone. I don't need a jam box or you know, I don't want to wear a headset or whatever. When you do, when you talk to people about up, like I've talked to like you know tens of thousands of people now about this, like every single person cares. And they all want to get better, no matter if they're like a you know superhuman athlete or they just haven't, you know, they're out of shape and haven't thought about it in a while, or they just wherever they are starting from, they all want to sort of get incrementally better. And mm -hmm. I think that the view here with something like this is like giving people the ability to understand things about themselves, mm -hmm. trying to translate that into meaning. So like, how does all this data relate to each other? And I, I'm fascinated by, so it's a you big. Do you think it's a big data problem? You think you? Oh, I think it's a massive data thing. So you think you, you collect a lot of data and you figure out things about? Well, about I think the that's individual? the thing because I think that people want to understand what they should think about the data. There needs to be that human personalized touch around like what the data is. Like I had this crazy insight in in up when I was in New York over the break. I went, I went um, to New York with my family and and I got there and I got this insight in the in the app. It was like you sleep very little in New York City, but you move a lot. And I was like, of and course. And that's doing that today. Yeah, that's doing that's that today. Crazy. And I was like, of course that makes sense. This is the city that never sleeps. There's always something going on, <laughs> but you're walking places, right? And just that level of insight to me was like, triggered all these other thoughts about like, what would it take for me to go to bed early? How should I structure my schedule? Mm -hmm. Just like, the awareness. Just the awareness changes everything. Yeah. And so can you take that to the next level? Like I'm fascinated by like, when we hang out, what is our behavior versus when you hang out with your fiance or mm -hmm. versus when you hang out with so-and-so, right? Do you eat this way? Do you feel this it's way? It's like your beer drinking hand goes up 10 times more <laughs> right. when you're hanging out with your bros. Right, exactly, versus when you're hanging out with your wife. Yeah. It's like you do different things or your kids, right? And what's your mood around that? And, and that's why we built some of that stuff into the app. So I think there's all that level of just like understanding how we are as people and mm -hmm. what's, what drives things. Like why sometimes do I sleep like 
four hours a night and I feel amazing versus I sleep eight hours and I'm still tired. What a problem is that to crack? Because there's been so many little startups, not little now, very large startups, like the, the Zio or whatever you put on your head and yeah, it like yeah. tracks your, your, I don't know what it does, but it, you know, when you wake up in the morning, it's supposed to wake you up at the right time so that it, apparently right. like if you wake up within this window of not REM sleep, but the other sleep. Light like, sleep. Light sleep. Light sleep, yes. Then you, you get know, a better night's sleep. We do the same thing, yeah. We does wake that you up really work? It does. I mean, it's actually how I live. I don't sleep that much. So I, I live I, on I, the... I follow you on, on You up, follow so me on up, you see my pathetic sleep. I'm like, yeah. oh, I only slept three and a half hours a night. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, But you actually feel better because it, it, it tells yeah, cause you... Yeah, because I don't wake up out of deep sleep. Like when you wake up out of a deep sleep cycle, you're right. sort of groggy because you're in this sort of real deep place. That is the right? weirdest thing where some, some mornings you wake up and you feel amazing with like five hours yeah. and really crappy with right. like nine. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and so it's like understanding that and understanding how it relates to the activity you did and where you were and you know. Do you have people, like I would imagine, I mean, you're, how many people are you now at your um, company? Uh, we're about 350. So, so you have a team of people that are dedicated just on sleep? Complete, well, we have a team of people on that. We have a team of people just looking at the data and trying to help like at a, at a sort of broader level create insights for people and, and, and try to create the machine learning around that. So that so, will grow. That will be a big part oh, of your yeah, organization absolutely, over time. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we're now sort of, we think of ourselves as like kind of hardware that's powered by software. We have a service with up, and now it's like we have a data component. How do we help you with that data that we have? Because the whole idea is like make your life better, yeah. right? Um, so that's where I think it's going. I think it's not just the health signals, but I think because people care so much, it's a great place to start. Um, and then I think it gets into all kinds of, uh, of crazy stuff where, you know, it's identity, it's all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I got to um, tell you, you relaunched the product here not too long ago, right? It's yeah, been, yeah, it's been about like mid-November mid last year. Yeah, so. and it's, it's awesome. Thank it's you. Got, it's got, the software is amazing. You've made you. huge strides forward in the software. Thank you. So. Yeah, no, I mean, look, we, we learned. I mean, yeah. We learned, we went back to the drawing board, we thought about like every moment in someone's day and how they would interact with it. Um, we spent a lot of time with guys like you who, who sort of have been creating applications that like hundreds of millions, if not billions of people love. And so what do you guys think about and how do we mix that with what we think about? And it was interesting, the journey was, was fascinating because what I realized about mobile apps, and this is like sort of one company's experience, is that it's actually a lot like the way we build hardware, um, where we've got to really define the problem set and create a really tight narrative and be really focused on are we driving to that problem set? Because in a mobile app, you don't have a lot of room to mess around. Mm -hmm. And nor do you, I think people get the opportunity to iterate a lot. You can iterate some, but you can't mm -hmm. iterate around. So you gotta get to a much higher level of resolution than you did necessarily on the web, mm -hmm. right? Where there was a little bit more of a forgiveness and people were willing to sure, come absolutely. on a journey with you, right? Yeah, no doubt. Whereas like people are in and out of apps so quickly. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, if someone uninstalls, I mean, think about like, if, if Yahoo Mail or something launches a new version on the web, you'll be like, oh, all right, I'll go log into my account just to see what it's all about. Right. But if you uninstall an app on your phone to convince someone to go back to the app store, find it, search, install it, it's, it's, it's over. It's over. It's game over. Yeah. So that, that cycle is much harsher. And so yeah, it, it, it reminds harsh. me a lot of hardware yeah. where you've got to be like really ruthless about, dude, what problem are we solving? Because yeah. we got one shot. <laughs> and if not, it's, it's out, we're done. So that, that was a big part of the journey too, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the show. This fun, has been man. amazing. It was awesome. It was really this is exactly fun. the stuff I wanted to talk about. Cool, So cool. We'll, we'll follow up when, uh, yeah. later on when you launch new stuff. It was stuff. awesome, dude. It was cool. fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm.